Greetings, everyone. It is my pleasure to be moderating this morning. Thank you so much for uh, joining us for a Demystifying Systemic SEL webinar, which is actually part of a series where we are looking at how to implement systemic SEL and integrate it through our educational system. Hopefully many of you were able to join us for our five previous webinars, just to refresh your memory, I'll tell you what they were. Um, one was on explicit SEL instruction, integrating SEL into academics, youth voice, supportive learning climate, and adult SEL. If you had to miss any of them, they are all on the CASTLE website. So I encourage you to look them up, sit back and enjoy and learn. So at this time, we'd like a little audience participation. So would you please write into the chat, what comes to mind when you think of supportive discipline? Oh, I see lots of great things going into the chat. Understanding. Restorative practices, not punishment. Thank you so much. So a major question is, so what does discipline have to do with SEL? When we work with our castle districts, addressing disciplinary infractions is so often the number one priority that they would like to address. While we should not be confusing uh, SEL with behavior management, the way we discipline students can indeed have a large impact on their social and emotional learning and development and the way students learn and practice social and emotional skills can indeed impact their behavior. Research shows us that SEL can promote positive pro-social behavior and responsive behaviors and actually decrease the risky behaviors that we really want to help students eliminate. Social and emotional skills such as relationship building and responsible decision making can help students get along with others, empathize with a different viewpoint, solve conflicts and come up with their own peaceful ways of resolving issues and dealing with their frustrations and disappointments. But it's important to clarify though that SEL is not a quick fix for misbehaviors. And just because a disciplinary, disciplinary action may stop a negative behavior, it often does damage, great damage to the students um, when we use tactics that are indeed punitive such as suspension and expulsion. And we know that those tactics are disproportionately used with black and brown students. So what does discipline look like when it is indeed supportive? And what, does, what, do we, what are we striving for in our webinar today? So in order to uh, get a sense, we're gonna begin with a short video that features um, strategies that were used inside Chicago Public Schools, um, a district that has spent years working on restorative approaches to discipline. So let's take a minute to see what's happening in Chicago Public Schools. What we want to teach our students is to kind of navigate through that conflict, take some accountability, ownership of that of when you do harm, and really learn the skill of reflecting on it. When we have better start up conversations with the students, when we can talk one-on-one -on -one and, and share our feelings, like this is how I feel right now, this is how you affected my teaching, this is how this impacted everybody else, how do you feel about this, or what would you do if you were me? And suddenly now they're, being, they're confronting it in the moment, being present on what really happened rather than making up excuses or rationalizing it away, blaming someone else for it. So we do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer conversations and teaching them how to talk to each other, and then we also do conflict resolution, a lot of that. We've also established more of a culture of respect and a culture of positive interactions. We're really stressing positive relationships. It's adults in this building that will give you a different point of view. It, most of the time, it prevents things from happening. When they start seeing other people, you know, faculty and staff members, generally caring about them, not just, hey, how you doing? 
but actually, how are you? Other faculty members here, they want us to graduate on time. This year has been really, really good. The hallway is peaceful. You have students in class. Grades went up, scores went up, NWA went up. We shown growth. So I would like very much to introduce our speakers, Anne Gregory, Dr. Anne Gregory, and Mary Jo Heblin to join me. So Anne Gregory, PhD, is a professor in school psychology at Rutgers University. Dr. Gregory is a researcher in the area of racial and gender disparities in discipline and is currently examining school-wide restorative practices and equity-centered social and emotional learning. She has authored over 60 peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters. Dr. Gregory recently received the Joseph E. Zinn's Early Ch uh, Career Contributions Award from CASEL, which is the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. Over the past 20 years, she has supported educators in their school discipline reform efforts. So welcome, Dr. Gregory. Thank you for being here. Mary Jo Hebling is Dean of Continuing Education. As at, in that position, she serves as a bridge between the IIRP faculty and graduate courses and the Institute's non-credit professional development offerings. She oversees sees the design of the professional development curriculum and supervises the instructors and coaches who work directly with schools and other organizations to implement restorative practices. Mary Jo has been a faculty lecturer since 2014, and, this, and she serves as a leadership coach with the IIRP Higher Education Collaborative. And I would like to again welcome both uh, Mary Jo and Anne who will share their expertise this morning. So we're gonna have a conversation. So I would like to open it up by asking, how would you describe discipline that is supportive in nature? What does it look like? If I wanted to like really get started, what would I have as my roadmap or my visual? And either one, I'm gonna, oh, I, no, let, me, let me call on Ann first and then Mary Jo. Sure, sure. You know, let me start a bit high level with the, the term support, because I, I think what we're looking here is for intervening and teaching as opposed to punishing and excluding. So I think that's an important phrase is intervening and teaching versus punishing and excluding. Um, so it, the word support, I think, is so robust because we can think of all kinds of support. So let's think about instrumental support. That's providing tangibles, tangible skills support as learning opportunities. We also can think about emotional support. And in some of my work, I have found that teachers who can really understand from a stance of empathy and love and caring, just like so many of you out there listening from around the world right now have done that with their students, that they dig deep to understand more about what's driving the behavior. So there's this kind of emotional support um, as part of this dimension. Um, so I, I guess wanted to start kind of high level. When we think about the word support, it's actually a really robust term that provides so much opportunity for us to move away from punishment and exclusion and exile and towards inclusion and bringing community together and learning through discipline. And I'll turn it to Mary Jo. Thanks, Anne. Um, I, I absolutely 100% agree with, with the... Um, the breadth of support, right? And I and I take a look at connecting support with discipline, and and um, we we have had conversation over the years uh, among uh, social emotional learning uh, advocates and practitioners and restorative practitioners, understanding the key element of belonging and relationship, right? So so when we hear the word support and we look at that breadth, um, it certainly includes deeply relationship and and creating a sense of belonging through that development of relationship. Mm -hmm. I also look at supportive discipline, right? So discipline, the word discipline, a um, couple of, of, of obvious meanings, right? Discipline meaning a code of, of conduct or expected behaviors, um, uh, some of which, uh, the definition, some of which goes to the point of 
of punishment as a result of not following that code, right? Um, and we also take a look at discipline as that study, right? The study, an area of study. And I, I've been challenged to take a look at how do we study the discipline of support? How do we study, right, the discipline of belonging and relationship and understand that balance of um, what you certainly mentioned also, and in relation to those connectedness of emotion, also expectations of, of a mutual relationship, right? So how do we interrelatedly, you and Anne, uh, you and I, Anne, right? You know, expect from each other certain things that we that we um, um, are willing, right, to to hold each other to. But in doing so, we are also strengthening that relationship, right? So understanding that who we are, what we need, what we need from each other and how do we bring that together and if we apply that uh, educationally certainly and I'm going to start with colleagues um, even though the most important people are those we serve our young people right and their families but if this belonging in this relationship among colleagues administrators doesn't exist how do we serve them well so it, it it's among all of us between and among all of us so I'll stop there for now. Yes, thank you so much. So, so I heard the focus on intervening and teaching, and I also heard the importance of creating a sense of belonging so that uh, young people are viewed as people who deserve to be taught as opposed to scarred, because so often people approach discipline with the intent to scar this individual as opposed to support this individual. So could either one of you speak a little bit about the adult mindsets and, and work that maybe you have had to do with districts to really help to um, you know, get the adult mindset to the point of understanding that discipline really is about intervening and teaching. Yeah, I mean, I, I really am happy that you're bringing up the idea of mindsets. I think a lot of us would say, start with mindsets, because what you have to do is unearth implicit beliefs about discipline, and that the only way to hold students accountable is through punishment and exclusion. That, that's sometimes what we hear, yes. even if it's not spoken. Mm -hmm. It's deeply felt in our bones. If we're raised that way, you know, if it's culturally synchronous with us, and so what, what I have really appreciated is when working with schools where they really try to, con to talk about those beliefs, don't try to ignore them, to give voice to it. So in one school I was in, they had every semester in a faculty meeting, they asked to the faculty, what's the purpose of school discipline? Let's talk about this. And they kept revisiting it. Why do we, what's school discipline for? And you know, we heard Mary Jo give us this rich definition of what discipline can be. And I think it was so powerful just to keep talking about mindsets moving towards repair, towards um, relationships, uh, towards healing, towards understanding, problem solving, and moving away from the kind of shut down, move out mentality, um, eye for an eye kind of uh, mindset. Yeah. Um... I, I've spent a, a number of years, um, again, dealing with, as I mentioned, adults first, right, in, in implementing this work. And I had to come to an understanding early on that the, the mindset of resistance, that, 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 that um, what, what presents as resistance is most often fear. So that mindset change I have found, and again, over years of probably making more mistakes early on than I would care to admit in relationship development, is rather than trying to sort of tear down that fear and say, why be so afraid, is to really, again, cultivate that bond or that belonging. Um, I have come to use the term, uh, the phrase, and we have actually not just myself, it's not as much of the what as the how, right? How do we do what it is we do? And I think that's about mindset, right? That there's, there's that balance of what do we know and how do we enact that? And to cultivate an openness 
in that mindset, I think has been the places where, where I and we have seen relationship and opportunity for change. Um, I think about, you know, going into some schools as a coach and working with the, the, uh, the, the discipline team, right, and uh, talking at, at length about uh, finding ways to put out the fires, right, as opposed to, or maybe not as opposed to, but along with, because those fires can't burn, right, we can't just let them burn, we have to address them, but along with finding ways to move in proactively and ahead of time, right, and I think that helps to change mindset as well, understanding that I can do this work in a proactive and preventative way, um, and have some relief in that uh, as, you know, uh, internally as, as an adult uh, serving young people or serving their families, or again, serving each other. I don't want us to forget about this collegial work too. The thing I want to say very relevant to what's happened in our, um, our, wet, you know, our, our panel this morning is thinking about an equity oriented restorative mindset, right? That I think that's another piece of the work is to understand that the move in my perspective away from punitive discipline is coming from decades and decades of documentation of the kind of harsh punitive treatment that we've seen in, in, and documented in many studies of African-American students, of Native American students, male students, students with disability. We've seen this again and again in studies. And so the mindset towards kind of a racial justice, social justice, is connected in this work, deeply connected. So when we go to dig at underneath the harm and unfair practice, we have to acknowledge historical harms, everyday harms, which we've seen here, yes. and that, 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 that pain and the pain of, of these kinds of use of language. Um, and it really is, let me just say, a call to action for all of us, keep at this work, that it, it has a, a really important social justice uh, mission, mission-driven work. Mm. And, and just to add to that, thank you for saying that, Anne. I think back to, to fear that I mentioned earlier and, and our fear, my fear, um, which I've been working on desperately and, and diligently as a white woman to not be afraid to address those issues, to not be afraid to talk about those cultural connections that need to occur um, and to identify you know, areas of, of inequity that, that I am uh, perhaps even contributing to, right? And how do we open that for real dialogue, which again, cultivates belonging. It cultivates relationship, um, as messy as it might be at times, um, it does. So thank you for that. Yeah, so what's, what's coming across very clearly is that you can't separate attending to discipline from overall school culture, environment, relationships. I always like to think of how people are hired, what mm -hmm. meeting time exists so people can really have deep, courageous conversations about all of the underpinnings that would lead a person to have such a negative slant on discipline. So, mm -hmm. so it really is a huge task, um, very much with SEL at the heart, because it is about relationship buildings and bonding and having just that kind of a context that can support this type of work. I think a lot of people <clears throat> automatically think of restorative practices. I'm going to ask Mary Jo first to talk a little, about, little bit about what restorative practices actually are. And then I'm going to ask Anne if you will talk about what are some other examples of supportive discipline that would not necessarily be categorized as restorative practices? Could you define a little bit more about what restorative practices are? Uh, yeah, restorative practices. Um, uh, we're, we're evolving as we really take a look at, at, at how to describe what, what restorative practices are, what a restorative practice practitioner uh, uh, creates, right? And we've mentioned the word relational uh, quite a bit already. And we're, we're actually working on pushing that term restorative and, and, hash, and not hashtagging, uh, slashing relational next to that. It is about relation. Now, 
Um, restorative justice, the roots of that, were obviously to respond to harm. And our work in restorative practices across uh, the country and across the world has been rooted in the work in justice. So right. to bring together people who care about each other and who are in conflict, whether it's a, a harm that has been created by a person or persons, or whether it's it's this mutual conflict that is, that is ensuing. Um, bringing together those voices and those people to address the harm. And in addressing the harm, impact is discussed. Clearly impact is discussed on those directly harmed and those who are harmed as a result of caring about those people. So in a school setting, when some harm occurs, it actually can and does impact much more broadly than just those students and teacher in the classroom or in that section of the cafeteria or in the faculty lounge. It actually impacts all. So how do we come together to find reparation of harm? So the essence of restorative practices is first and foremost to build purposely relationships, to work at that, to use those social and emotional learning castle competencies, to develop relationships more than just in a 45 minute period, but every moment that I'm with another human being, with I'm with another student. So I'm working on that proactively. When harm occurs, because no matter how wonderful that relationship may be developed where human beings, harm will occur. We come together and we take a look at what expectation, what standard, what, what um, behavior that creates safety that's been agreed upon has, has, been, um, has been broken, right? And how then is that impact felt and what will repair the harm? So it's not about decreasing accountability. It's about, and actually it is about decreasing punishment because we know that punishment does not impact change in behavior, right? It usually just kind of keeps cultivating that behavior. It also doesn't repair the harm. Most people who are harmed don't see that punishment as, oh, okay, I feel better now. There might be a piece of that. There might be some retribution that people feel, you know, in their guts, maybe even some of us sometimes momentarily. But it's really about that reparation. What do I need to be able to move on? And how do we reintegrate that relationship? So it's that balance of expectations, support, relationship, restoration, repair, and it's that consistent work to do that on a day-to-day -day basis. That was a bit of a nutshell. <laughs> so. Thank you, thank you. But I love, I love your focus on impact being discussed because we cannot expect young people to make a more responsible decision next time right. if they have not really delved into the impact. So thank you for, for your explanation. Okay, Anne. And I, maybe if I just might stay with the impact for a second to just reiterate Mary Jo, just to kind of hear it again, the idea that others are impacted, right? So it's not, it's not just the disputants involved in an interaction, it's the people who are watching, care about it, it's the whole community. And I think really the premise of the work is that when we connect and build community, we care when there's ruptures and we care enough to yeah. work together to, to heal it, all right? So you act more about, you know, you asked about other kinds of practices. And what I think is, um, it's, it's such a value-driven work that there's so many practices. It's about having that um, really intentional focus on building relationships. So if we think about it, it's happening all the time where we see positive relationships, for example, in classrooms occurring. Uh -huh. When a teacher goes, to kind of lean in and, and just check in with a student quietly about how their grandmother's doing. You know, like those are the moments I think where you're, you're strengthening relationships. So it might not, uh, that practice in and of itself may not be kind of in a restorative practice training per se, but it is part of that value system mm -hmm. of all those little micro affirmations. It could be that, you know, we talk about that a lot, the greeting in the front at the door, who's at the building level, who's connecting with that parent, just checking in a positive note home. All of those very conscious relationship building practices are part of it. So it's not all a prepackaged, you know, program where you turn to lesson six and do this. It's a, again, going back to the mindset, it's these mindsets of commitment to one another, 
to heal together. All community has conflict, but when you buy in, care enough to put that energy back in to work on repair and healing and growth and learning. Thank you, thank you. So it sounds like, as we all know, this is very proactive work. It's about putting the climate and culture structures in place where the relationships are solid enough. So yes, when there's that occasional infraction, it is not handled in a punitive way because the school culture and climate just does not operate that way. So, so there's a very holistic approach to this work. And in part of thinking holistically, I wanna bring up our students. So um, my question is, what's the role of youth voice in mm. supportive disciplinary practices? What, what is the expectation? How, how do youth express themselves? When are there the opportunities? So what is the role of youth voice? Oh my gosh, just like with S systemic SEL, youth voice should be centered in the work in so many ways. So let, 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 let's start from something like a community building circle, right? The very structure of a circle in terms of creating room for voice. Now we've heard teachers say, you know, I haven't heard much from this student all year. And then they, you know, they have their hands on a talking piece. They're at, at, they're responding to a very relevant prompt and their voice is heard. And some of my research in uh, surveying hundreds of students about their experience of community building circles, it's the voice that they say, this is why I value this yes. because I'm increasing my own, this is my language, but self and social awareness. When we code the students' responses, it's often about I'm feeling heard and I get to hear my peers in a respectful space, what they have to say. So voices is just a uh, center cornerstone of the work. And I just also would like to say another piece of student voice and comprehensive school discipline reform is student leaders, restorative hmm. practice leadership. And I've seen it done just so with so much inspiration, looking at middle schoolers and high schoolers really taking the lead and working with adults to help them change their mindsets and integrate it. In, in one school, the students developed a fidelity checklist so they could go in and they could observe circle process and say, hey, you know, let's talk through how you could improve your circle facilitation, dear teacher. Um, so you can see uh, students becoming the advocates. And then one last point I wanna make about this, we know um, uh, adopters of programs are on a, on a, you know, on a spectrum. Some are more hesitant. Some, you know, have rightfully feel like it could be like a flavor of the month. It's the student voice that you hear that can shift that for them. When the students say, can we please do a circle? Or are they knock on the peace room door and say, look, there's some conflict bubbling up and we can all sit down together. It's those student advocates, the student leaders that can really help bring a comprehensive discipline reform process into play. Thank yeah, you. Um, I, I could dovetail so, so well with that. Uh, and you mentioned community building circles with students, um, uh, including students and in setting norms, you know, for, for semesters, for classrooms, for uh, lunch rooms, whatever that may be, really including voice in that in, a, in a, an unauthentic way. Um, I also um, I think very, very highly of, of training or empowering students to be circle keepers. Uh, I too had an experience in a high school where um, uh, the principal there said, look, my, my staff is resistant, but my students aren't. Can you work with them? I went, oh my gosh, yes. Because number one, I love and miss working with students uh, the, 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 in the years that I haven't been directly. And um, what happened over the course of that year with the, this uh, a growing group of, of uh, student circle leaders who were going into classrooms to do what you described, run the circles, uh, model for teachers, invite them in. Uh, over the course of time, uh, there was a change in, in acceptance and practice, um, and it became a partner work. Uh, so the student voice, not only is it critical, but it, it can motivate and change in the adults, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the building and, and those who are, who are resistant. And uh, the last thing I just think about is 
asking the students, there are, there are restorative questions that are rooted Mm -hmm. uh, initially in response to harm, right? But we, we also know they can be uh, adapted a bit for actually uh, encouraging positive behavior. Um, and any question that elicits um, affect and emotion and thoughts and ideas need to be asked of the students as well as, as the adults. Um, so bringing them in, we, we encourage uh, schools that are implementing restorative practices uh, to develop a restorative leadership team and include students in that team. Um, so it, it's just critical. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And did you want to add or? Well, I just wanted to add again, I, I'm sorry, I keep like re wanting to echo some of Mary, Mary Jo's comments, but this idea that when you turn the problem solving and conflict to the student, so what has happened, who's been harmed, what can we do to it, that is about student voice too. Right. That is what has been your experience? What do you need at, at, if you've been harmed to feel more healed or repair? What do you need? That's, it's, a, it's such a, a kind of almost just huge transformation in how we can do these interactions where we shift the problem solving to the young folks and just scaffold and support them in learning those skills. And that is about their voice. Thank you. Um, so Mary Jo, I heard you mention changes in acceptance in practice. So that made me think of parents and other caregivers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how um, supportive discipline may or may not be in sync with how they view discipline and how they approach discipline um, in their home. So would you talk a little bit about the involvement of parents and caregivers um, in terms of being advocates for the supportive approach? What has it taken? Um, any stories of transition in a parent? So Mary Jo, I see you shaking your head, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think um, we won't know what the difference or the, or the alignment between a family and our work is until we have a relationship with them, until we talk to them, right? And sometimes that does, we don't find that out until something happens, right? So we have an incident and we come into some tension with a parent who is perhaps uh, rescuing of their student or perhaps uh, on the other end, right, you know, and more demanding, more even more highly demanding than we are. So we don't know that until we develop it. So number one is to be proactive with the families and to be mm -hmm. proactive with the parents in a, in a large scale connection, but also teachers in uh, seeing that the social emotional well being of themselves and their students will include their parents or their families of origin, what, however, whatever that makeup may be. Um, I've said many times, the families of our students are in the buildings every day, even though they're not physically there, right? Um, so how do we connect with them? So in that really absolutely, absolute proactive way. Um, the other piece uh, is, again, in, we talked about student voice, right? And empowering them and training them or, you know, uh, giving them the skills to do that. I've had the fortune in some schools as well to meet with parents and train them and to see the impact of what was, and this is a, probably a, a bit of a typical story, but in, in more than one occasion, having a meeting with parents in September, early October, and there were five or six of them there. And uh, by the end of that school year, there were 30 or 40 mm -hmm. slowly growing, right? You know, and, it, and I didn't grow it, they grew it, right? Um, the coaches don't grow it. It's about, I mean, it, there's something about the relationship that's developed, right, that continues to keep people. So there, it's really key, just as we talk about student voice to give family voice and not just wait for the conflict to occur. Now, um, you know, communicate the chasm between um, the system, the school system and the families have it, it's been growing for a long time. Right. Um, and, and, and I believe that it's narrowing in the work that, um, you know, social emotional learning and restorative practices and, and other supportive uh, uh, programs and connections that are happening. But the chasm has to narrow based, we have to be a part of that narrowing, right? So we can't, I, I, you, my, my, my picture is with your hands on your hips saying, oh, those parents, you know, and just shaking your head, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, 
oh, parents, you know, and extending that hand and, and finding ways to slowly narrow that chasm. And I think that's a teacher's responsibility, it, you know, in, 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 um, in their classroom. I think it's obviously administrative. Um, and then as we empower them, they may empower others, you know, and, and build that, 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 uh, that connection. Um, it is about training. It is about inclusion. It is about asking them what yes. do they need and not assuming we have all the answers for them because we Thank don't. You. I have a question about support because there may be many people watching the webinar who are eager to do this or maybe who are in the midst of doing this and recognizing that there is a need for supports. If we're going to have restorative practices or supportive um, discipline, it's imperative that there be supports available. So what are some of those supports? And what are the risks of trying to implement without supports? What a great question. I, I think um, I, I want to just back up to you know, a lot of school districts might take on restorative practices without understanding the, that there is a big scope to the work, that mm -hmm. it's really, what I've seen sometimes is schools will think that it's more of a kind of a conflict mediation uh, yeah. end, as opposed to what we've been talking about, which is more systemic. And so I interviewed a lot of practi practitioners and principals about the different component parts of the implementation. And I actually put together a a guide, you know, it's one of those 12 indicator guides and, you know, lots of indicators, but, and I, which is free and available, can put into the chat if people are interested. But I think the first thing is for leaders to understand the scope of the work. Mm -hmm. And actually a principal, you know, noted to me, and I just, I have to share this, that she said, look, you can't have the work be siloed in this one narrow domain. It's mm -hmm. incumbent upon me as the leader to bring up restorative practices, relational approaches, yes. in every meeting with the PTA, you're working with it, build capacity in the attendance considerations in, in um, you know, academic considerations. And that she had a group of folks who also were positioned on every kind of powerful committee in the building, connecting whatever that topic was to restorative practice. And, and that keep weaving that thread through the work that, so in terms of supports, I think the first piece is to know the big picture. What are we talking here? Um, are, we're talking about universal supports. We're talking about community building efforts. We're also talking about a shifting our discipline policy and code. We're also talking about um, training highly trained folks to, to lead more restorative conferencing. Um, so I just want to say that starting point is understand the comprehensive nature of the work. And I'll turn it over to Mary Jo, as I'm sure a lot to say about training supports as well. I, I do, Anne. Um, and and um, one of the um, elements of, of our work that, that we have really committed to over these last number of years is readiness assessment, right? So that we understand what supports there are needed and um, to, in, to incorporate uh, and involve the voice of administration, of teachers, of cross-functional uh, groups, as well as, again, students and parents, not forgetting them, um, to pull in what, what readiness, um, uh, where their readiness assessment is, right? Because we don't want to just, you know, throw this this project or this money, right, um, which is you know well earned and, and developed, right, the sources into just check box checking. Okay, so box checking is the least support that 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 folks need. So it really is about readiness. Uh, the other thing that we've learned very much more uh, specifically in these recent years is that training, while critical and needs to be across the board, is the tip of the iceberg. And ongoing learning and ongoing coaching is critical. And the other piece of that we learned recently is we, the outsiders, you know, the trainers, the, the coaches, the consultants from the outside organizations aren't the ones to coach in an ongoing way. It's got to come from within. So we have to together build that capacity within so that that support 
is within the building, the community, the organization, and among those leaders, and then eventually, you know, shared uh, among them. So it really is that critical uh, ongoing of attention to the work. It's not one and done. And, you know, I say this often, I've been in this line of work for a lot of years. So for all intents and purposes, I'm an expert and I'm still learning more deeply what it means to be restorative, what the social emotional well-being, um, uh, the critical nature of that in my relationships, in the work that I do. Um, so it's ongoing. And if I could just add what I think it's so important is when you think about implementation supports, and it doesn't always have to be these outside coaches, right? but to think about your internal capacity, your flexibility and creativity for professional development. So just a quick example, there was a, um, uh, an incident, uh, there was, a uh, sorry, an assistant principal who thought this teacher could use a little more help seeing um, very effective circle keeping. And so he said, can I please just sub in, run your circle while you go down the hall to, you know, your colleagues class and just spend 10 minutes doing an observation and we'll debrief later. And there was mm -hmm. such a community of trust. It wasn't, it didn't feel punitive. She was like, oh, that'd be great. Thank you for this opportunity. And she ran down the hall. Now that wasn't her getting massive release time. She got a quick, some coverage. And I was really impressed with that principal's commitment to finding learning opportunity, adult learning opportunities naturally within the day and recognizing the expertise within house. Right. Yeah, that's that internal ongoing coaching yes. that is so critical to occur. Absolutely, Anne. Great story. Yes. So there are a couple questions in the chat that I am going to pose. One is, what is the tipping point in systems where this really sticks? What have you seen as some major changes? Ooh. Can you go first on that one, Anne? <laughs> sure. I mean, I, we, you know, this question I get all kind yeah, of researchy about tipping points and, right. um, how, you know, creating cut scores. <laughs> so I'm trying not to go in that direction. Um, I, I did want to respond something in the chat that in terms of the indicator guide, I know that I, I sent out a link that can be popped into the chat. So Patrick, I think, was going to drop it in the chat. It's yellow. So if it comes up. But in terms of the tipping point, I would like to just say um, a few things about uh, the commitment it takes from leaders to facilitate sustainability. Because I think what I've seen a lot is uh, uh, leaders can really start to uh, uh, take on the talk, you know, and they, mm -hmm. they it's wax poetic and it, it's lovely. But then when you push around resources and time and scheduling in an overstressed system, that's where things become not sustainable. What I've seen is there's a few things that are really key. It's um, having space to do things like peace circles and restorative conferencing space, which is at a premium. Mm -hmm. Having some highly trained people who are have a flexible schedule to be able to be free in the day. That's again, not a small thing. Um, and also um, setting time aside and around community building activities and not letting that get squeezed out. We see that a lot. We see like the squeezing out of the SEL work, the squeezing out of the intentional community building. And I think when leaders say, look, this is a real priority, I always serve, when I survey staff, I always say, is this work a priority? It's very telling because you can hear an administrator say it is, but then right. if 50% of your staff say, no, 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 we've read between the lines, this isn't a priority. So I think I would just suggest that in terms of ticking, tipping points and sustainability, there's a real um, putting some kind of, you know, uh, real effort resource from the leaders into this initiative for stick with itness is yes. absolutely key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. And I think it was tipping point that um that that had me sigh <laughs> when I first heard it, uh Deirdre. But um I would agree. I we're working with a rather large uh, uh Midwest uh district and we've been working with them for a year already and not one teacher's been trained until next week. It's been all leadership. Uh, central office and building leadership. And I think even though that's the start, I think in a way that's the tipping point, right? You know, or a tipping point, there probably are many throughout. Um, so just to support, you know, what you mentioned and absolutely that idea about leadership, um, you know, first and being able to do the work and, and we have a bunch of trainers going in in a, in a week or so to go, but you know what? All those leaders are gonna be in those trainings with them. And that's what's going to be more powerful than any of us there. 
right? Even though we have the curriculum, um, we leave and they're there. Um, so I think that is a, a, certainly at least an initial tipping point. One other piece that, that I guess I might add, because this was in the, uh, that RAND study uh, from Pittsburgh was, and I, I'm not sure if this is a tipping point, but it seems to be, uh, I'm not the researcher. So, um, but uh, schools that uh, had uh, leadership investment and schools that were able to commit time, right, to the community building and the ongoing learning realized more success, right? So there's that, that measure there. Thank you. That, that fidelity of implementation piece, sorry, Deidre, it's just is key, right? Yeah. We know yeah. that for sustainability, it's more than a year. I, you know, I just, uh, we just had some new results from an experimental trial showing after a year, the restorative practice program versus in the comparison schools reduced uh, incidents, discipline incidents. So there, even in one year, we see some traction around prevention. Other studies in the Pittsburgh study, for example, after a few years, we see reduced suspensions. Um, however, you know, there's real consensus in, in the intervention world if it takes, you know, three to five years of, of really strategic planning over time for such a comprehensive work. And I think what I, another piece that I think is fundamental is having a, uh, the a task force, just like Mary Jo, who are real leaders in the school, but also diverse. Not everybody has to be 100% on board. It's important right. to, to bring people in who have more cautious approach to innovations, who can lend some of that, hear, you know, speak about some of their concerns, how implementation needs to be improved. Um, and it should represent those task force a varied uh, folks with all different kind of um, places in the hierarchy, because you really want to be able to have increased buy-in um, by bringing leaders in who can then kind of spread the word through, um, which often we hear like through the hallways, right, in, in, in the teacher's lounge, et cetera. Thank you. I think we have time for, for one more question. Um, someone is asking, sometimes students don't know what will make things right. Mm -hmm. So what are some strategies that you use when students say, I really don't know? Mm -hmm. What can make things better mm -hmm. when there has been harm? Well, first of all, they're not the only ones who are asked that question. And that's mm -hmm. part of the process. That's mm -hmm. part of the community responsibility because you're right. And, and I might not even know what you need, Deidre, if I were to, you know, to harm you, or I, I, I might not know what anybody needs as a, as a repair to the harm that happened earlier in this meeting, right? I don't know how to do that. It's through that process. It's through the questions um, that I may be able to, right? Look a person in the eye and say, I don't know how to repair the harm. What might I be able to do? What might help? You know, and even that's hard. Yeah. And I'm not going to just say for students, it can be hard for us as well. And I think that that, that gets at our uh, kind of desire for some sort of three ring binder with like, right. if this occurs, then this is what's repaired, how we repair. And, and what I think um, we really have to think about the context, the individuals, what kinds of needs are in the space. There was one school that every day held a meeting at the end of the school day to say, what did we need to do, to do today? If anyone could come, if there was conflict involved, that we could do better in terms of repairing harm. And then how is the repair process related to our kind of constitution, our core values? They kept weaving those together. But what I was struck by in this everyday meeting was the learning going on. It wasn't leading to a cookie cutter. It was that we're just going to keep pushing together as a community to say, you know, uh, what kinds of uh, reparative acts that are occurring should more be done? How did people feel about these processes today? All right, here we go. Let's go into tomorrow and then we'll come back again tomorrow and keep learning together about this process. Yes, um, I was glad to hear you say that, you know, there's a way at the end of the day for the students to come back because someone actually wrote a question about how can we help students become more reflective Mm -hmm. Especially if, um, you know, a person who's done the harm really doesn't know what they need. You know, do you ask them what they need? And then how do we help students become more reflective mm -hmm. in expressing what they need? Right. So, all right. Thank you much. So we're going to have some key takeaways. Thank you to everyone who put um, uh, questions in the Q&A. Some of you have been writing, can we have links to resources? Yes, you will be getting 
all of those. You will be getting all the resources, all the studies that were mentioned. So we have several key takeaways from today's session. The first one is when discipline practices are centered around student learning, development, developmentally appropriate and culturally responsive, they can reinforce SEL and support student engagement and equitable outcomes. That's a practice takeaway. So a policy takeaway is that discipline policies should encompass proactive strategies that focus on relationship building and ensure that disciplinary responses address root causes and support students' social and emotional development. And finally, we have a research takeaway, which is continuous improvement processes should examine and address how equitably disciplined responses are applied. More research is needed on the impact of restorative practices and other supportive disciplinary approaches. Thank you.